Good morning, everybody. My name is John Mullins, and I'm from Themis. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in just one moment. I know we got some more people joining us here in just a second, but we'll go ahead and get started. I know everybody's very busy and uh, looking forward to this topic. Plus, you need to get back to work and, and get on with your day as well. Today's webinar uh, title is Interpreting Explain Plan Output. And uh, like I said, my name is John Mullins. You can see on the screen there, you should be able to see on the screen there, uh, there's my email address, jmullins at themasync.com. And you should be also be able to see the, the main website URL for Themis, themasync.com. And today's presentation, the slides will be are available out at themasync.com slash webinars. And later on, you'll be able to also get the uh, recording of uh, this webinar at that same site. Just give us a little while to get that, the recording part posted out there. But the slides will be uh, available right away. All right, well, so thank everybody for joining us today. A little bit about my background. I, I notice a lot of the names that are joining us today are people that I've seen in class before. So good to, good to see you again. Um, Again, my name is John Mullins with Themis. Um, I've been using Oracle back since the early, kind of to mid-80s, so back in 1984 or so. I started off with Oracle version 5, which wasn't really much more than just a repository for data. It didn't have uh, nearly the features that it has today in there, but started off as a developer, a programmer, and worked as a DBA as well, and then since then I've been doing consulting and teaching. Uh, a lot of classes. Uh, you'll see some of those classes listed a little bit later on. I am an Oracle certified professional DBA, um, so I still work as, as far as, as a developer, programmer, and DBA as well, so I've kind of seen it from both sides as far as tuning SQL goes. Um, I'm also a certified technical trainer, so you know, many of you that have had some of my classes before know what that means. Um, that means our classes are, are fairly structured, yet very laid back. So I invite you to enjoy today's presentation. Um, ask questions um, as you have those. I'll try to get to all the questions I can, but with the time frame we have, I may not be able to get to all those. But if you do have questions for later on, feel free. I'll put this back up there. Uh, feel free to uh, just send me an email at jmullins at themasync.com, and I'll get to those questions as soon as I can. All right, like I said, I'm representing Themis today. Themis has been around for quite some time, offering a lot of different training uh, topics for you. Um, you know that we offer those both on-site at your place and online over the Internet in public uh, places as well. We have lots of different topics available for you from mainframe, DB2, SQL Server, down to the middle range with Unix and Linux and Java, web development, and then, of course, with Oracle as well. Um, everything from beginner to advanced in SQL, PL SQL, and database administration. So feel free to visit our website, and we'll show some other information later on. All right, today's topic is kind of related to one of the other classes that we have called Oracle SQL Optimization, and that's for developers and DBAs both. So we'll mention that a little bit later on as well. I know you're anxious to get into the topic here. All right, so what we're going to do today is we're going to we're, the webinar will last about 45 minutes or so, and we're going to talk about explain plan, that utility, and what it's used for, but more import importantly, what are some of the things that we're going to look for in uh, that environment? So we want to make sure that uh, um, we know what types of things we should look for, what types of things we should give a higher priority to, um, and uh, how to look for those things. You know, what, what are we looking for? What does it look like? Um, so we'll talk about those things there. Uh, we're not going to go into necessarily how to run Explain Plan. Um, as many of you know that have used it before, it's something that's very simple to run, um, but it's much more difficult to interpret depending on which tool or utility that you're running it from. So you could run it from anything from SQL Plus, which isn't going to give you any help at all, right? I'm just going to display the plan, and then it's up to you to interpret the plan, decide what's good and what's bad. Two, if you're using SQL Developer, or if you're using Toad, or something else that might, you know, at least highlight some of the things in the plan with colors, red, yellow, green, indicating 
things that you might look at, things that could be uh, problems or things that might be okay too. So well, we're going to talk about we've got the plan already. Um, how do we look at it? All right. So as many of you know, explain plan is just going to show us the execution path, the access path that something called the optimizer has decided for our SQL. That's you know how it's going to physically run our code. Uh, and that information, once the optimizer decides on it, is going to be stored up in memory on the database server in something called a library cache, which is something that's inside another larger memory structure called the shared pool. So as you issue, let's say, a select statement, Oracle's first going to make sure the syntax is okay. From there, he'll do what's called a semantic check to make sure that um, you're accessing tables you have privileges to, that the columns you're referring to are valid columns within those tables. So he'll get table definitions, column definitions, security privileges, uh, those types of things. Make sure that those are all in place. And if your syntax passes and your semantics pass, then he goes and looks in that shared pool in memory to see if this statement has ever been run before. And if it has, if he does a match on that, then he can just reuse the execution plan that's there. If not, that's what brings us to today. So if the plan is not in the shared pool, then the optimizer has to come up with this access path or execution plan for your statement. And we're going to kind of talk a little bit about what kind of things he looks for there too. Once he comes up with your execution plan, out of all the alternative execution plans he looks at, then he'll store that in memory um, in that library cache, and then it can be reused later on um, if that statement's executed again. All right, so just to kind of start, we'll kind of work our way from the top down a little bit here. So first part here will be very simple. Um, you know, you have some explained plan output. Um, depending on which tool you run it from, it could look slightly different. So it could be more graphical, less graphical. It could have additional columns that you don't see here on this particular page. Um, this is just one example. This was run from SQL Plus, and this was displayed. Um, many of you know there's a, a package in Oracle called DBMS underscore XPlan. And in that package, there's a, a table function called display, and that can read our plan table and hopefully format it such that it's a little bit easy to read there. So we know that, um, you know, how do we interpret this little plan that we have here? And, and this is an actual plan. Um, you can see the different steps in there. It looks like we've got some accesses to an employee table and a department table. We have some index accesses in there. We're going to talk about all those here in, in just a little bit. Um, and then the question becomes, okay, where do I start? Well, we're going to go whatever is indented to the furthest to the right. So whatever is the furthest indented, so we're going to read it from the inside out. So if we take a look at, at this particular example, we're going to start down in here. The ID on the left doesn't indicate the order. That's just an ID for that particular task. So it looks like here that task number four, um, let me go back to that page there, task number four, the table access full. So we did a full table scan on the department table first. All right, and then we have ID number five. So I, I listed the order of the operations down below for you there too. So he's going to do a, um, a full table scan on department, um, followed by an index range scan there as well. And he's going to do what's called a nested loop join um, between the department table and in the ca this case, the employee table. Okay, so what he'll do in this case, he's going to read one record from the department table and then scan the employee table for matches. And hopefully what he's doing with the nested loop, when he's scanning that, that, that when he scans the employee table, he's doing that via an index. So typically, not always, but typically, there's going to be an index on the foreign key column in that other table. And that's one of the things the optimizer is looking at when he's trying to decide uh, which plan to do, which method to use to join the tables. We'll talk more about all this stuff here, like nested loops and hash joins in just a moment. So I'm not going to go into detail on those just quite yet. But we just want to understand the order first. Now, if you have two items that are indented to the same um, place, you're going to read them typically, depends on the tool, depends on the script, but typically you're going to read it then from the top down. 
Okay, so go inside, uh, find what's indented the furthest. Um, if you have a couple items that are tied for that, then go ahead and read it from the top down. Okay, and you can get a copy of this slide. You can go back through the order of operations down below and see if that makes sense for you. Now, once we understand the order, <clears throat> then we're going to look at each of the individual operations along the way to see if they make sense. So step one, <clears throat> excuse me, is just to find what was done first, see what the operation was, know your tables, know your data, know your indexes, uh, and see if that makes sense. See if that's a good choice. Did it, why did he do a full table scan on department? Were there indexes available for him to use or not? If there were indexes available, why didn't the optimizer not use them? So we need to know what kind of things caused the optimizer not to use an index. Things like the not equal operator or maybe a row function on that particular field that has the index. Or maybe we're just returning more records, um, a higher volume of records, a higher percentage of records from the table and he thought a full table scan would be more efficient. Um, there's parameters in the database that help him decide whether to do a full table scan or an index scan and the DBAs are well aware of those types of things. So we'll go into that, those details here in just a few moments. Okay? All right, here's what we're looking for in that, out, in that output from the explain plan. And this, I, I kind of put them in the order that a lot of people do. Now, some people are going to have different orders here too, but typically a lot of people are going to look for the full table scans first. Now, the reason they do that is two. Um, one, they're easy to find. And two, we all understand what a full table scan is. So we'll typically start there. We're going to go through each one of these in separate slides here in just a moment. As we go through the, the webinar here, if you do have questions in your, in your dashboard for the webinar, there is a question uh, little tab over there. You can go ahead and post those over there as we go through here. Uh, don't use the chat box, but use the, the question box there. And I'll, like I said, I'll try to get to them, as many of those as possible. So we're going to look for full table scans. And like I said, we'll go through each of these individually. We'll look for join methods. Did he do, or we're doing, maybe doing a join. Did he do a nested loop? Did he do a hash join? Did he do a sort merge join? What did he do? Um, we're going to look at the different index access methods. Did he do an index range scan, unique scan, full scan, fast full scan, skip scan? We've got lots of choices there. And all these things are, are appropriate under certain circumstances. So, you know, uh, a nested loop join isn't good in every every possible scenario. So it's good for some things, bad for others. And that's what we have to know. When is it good? When is it bad? And then later on, we can decide, okay, how can I get him to change the plan? Whether that be through um, adjusting some index, uh, parameters for my database, whether that be for um, maybe some of my memory structures need to be adjusted in their size. Do I need to rewrite my query? Um, are my indexes not that great? Are my statistics off? Uh, there are so many things to consider here. And then we'll, we'll look at uh, filters. You know, a filter is what's in your where clause. Okay, when does those when do those filters get applied? Do they get applied before the before any joins or after any joins? And that's important. Um, does any part of my uh, execution of my statement is any part of it run in parallel okay so was any of it run in parallel so we know that certain parallel operations might just happen on their own based on parameter settings and database settings and such and other parallel operations we might have to um, maybe get the optimizer to consider those maybe through a hint and so, so, so there are some parallel hints that we can use um, in our SQL code as well. Okay. All right. How about uh, table partitioning? So with the table partition, that's a very common thing. I said we'll go through these in detail. But a table partition is just a, a single heap table that's been divided into partitions, and it's usually done that way because we have a high volume of data in the table, and we could, you know, physically separate the data into smaller subsets based on some criteria, whether it's a list like, okay, I'm going to put all my region codes 
1 through 10 in this partition, 11 through 20 in this partition, so it could be a list. Um, I could do it by a range, like I'm going to put everything for January, uh, January 1st to January 30th in this partition, February 1st to February 28th in this one, so do it by a date range. Um, we could do have hash partitions, we can have sub partitions, and so this is a very common practice. And what it does for us is if you come out and you say a, a query like where um, the order date is uh, January 30th, he knows that, that there are no January 30th records in partitions 2 through 100. Based on the definition of each partition, he knows they're only in partition one, maybe. And so he, even if he does a full table scan, he only has to scan one partition and not the entire ta table for all the dates there. And that could be a very powerful thing. All right, and then we're looking at object statistics. Okay, so each of our objects have statistics that are out there. And so part of the explain plan will, <clears throat> excuse me, will let us know whether or not statistics were available for that particular query. Excuse me there, losing my voice a little bit. Um, so one thing we're looking for in that explain plan there is it'll show us whether statistics were used or not or whether the optimizer had to go out and, and find statistics dynamically on the fly for your query. So we'll see that in there too. And then <clears throat> we have an overall cost for this plan. So every plan that the optimizer considers gets a cost. And what he's presenting back to you, the plan that he's deciding to use, will be the plan that has the lowest cost. Okay, we'll talk more about cost in just a little bit. All right, so let's take a look at each one of these here. All right, so full table scans, easy to find. We just have to decide, is this full table scan acceptable or not? Now, what's bad about full table scans, if they have any volume of data at all, is that, and even if the, the data in the table is slight, whenever the optimizer decides to do a full table scan, he has to read all the blocks from the very bottom of the table <clears throat> up to something called the high water mark. The high water mark is the, at any point in time, the, the most data you've ever had in the table, that's the block um, that represents that, okay? If you have a table that you have insert activity into and you have delete activity into, the deletes, it's deleting records, but it's not, and it may be making some blocks empty and other blocks not empty, the delete does not lower the high water mark. So you'll, you'll even notice um, in some cases, you might, just as a practice and an extreme example here, we know we should use maybe the truncate to delete every record out of a table. But if I were to use the delete command to delete every record out of a table, the high watermark remains wherever it was. And so if I come back later and do a select count asterisk from that table and I'm expecting a zero, it could very well take two minutes to display the zero because he had to read through every empty block up to the high watermark to get that answer. So if you know that you're not going to be putting, if you delete some records, whether it's all the records or some of the records, doesn't matter. <clears throat> if you know you're going to delete some records and not necessarily replace them in the near future, you may consider lowering the high watermark. Okay, now there's a question there of how do we lower the high watermark? Okay, it's a two-step process. There's, there's multiple ways to do it. But we can do it in two commands um, is the simplest way. So what we could do is, there's a command, we could do an alter table, enable row movement, and then we can do an alter table, shrink space command. Okay, we have to do the enable row movement first because what he might do is move some of the records around to make the blocks uh, more efficient. 
And every record has what's called a row ID. And so if, if I tell him, I'm going to allow you to move the records, that means they're going to go to different blocks. That means they'll get different row IDs as well. OK. OK, there was another question there about regenerating stats. Would that lower the high watermark? And answer there is no. Uh, it, could, it will show. The, the new number of records in the table, um, but the number of blocks won't change. So even though I've deleted maybe a bunch of records, it'll now show the number of records is 1,000, but the number of blocks prior to the delete will remain the same because many of them happen to be empty. Okay, so first thing we're going to look for are full table scans. Are they good or are they bad? I would then go out and take a look at if they, I do have some full table scans out there. You know, if you're doing them on large tables, you know, that could be a problem. You know, if, why did he do the full table scan? Are indexes available or not? Check out the indexes. If the indexes aren't there, consider creating one. If the indexes are there, um, why weren't they used? Got to ask those questions there. All right, how about join methods? Okay. I was just looking at a few of the questions there. Yeah, if we move data around from one table to another, one partition to another, that will um, adjust the high watermark for us. All right, those are good questions. All right, next thing we're looking for, if we are doing joins, um, what type of join did the optimizer choose to do? Okay. All right, there, there are three major ones that, that the optimizer will choose from. Now, there's one way that we typically hope that he would not choose from, but we look at a nested loop, a hash join, a sort merge join, and then if we want to say it this way, the dreaded Cartesian join, which we typically you know, do by accident most of the time. We, we might want to do that, but uh, um, we want to avoid those typically. Okay. All right, I'll get to some, I'll check back on some of those questions here in just a moment. All right, let's go ahead and let's take a look at each of these join methods because they each will have their own place. Um, some are going to be good for some things, some will be good for other things. So let's look at the nested loop first. Um, nested loop is best for those types of queries, those type of applications where you want to get the first rows back quickest. So in other words, it may not have retrieved all the rows yet, but he has found some of them that do match as far as the join goes, and he'll start returning those right away. So what we typically have is it, it's always best when you think about these joins to think about them just with two different objects, because that's all the optimizer is doing. Even if you're doing a 10-table join, the optimizer is only looking at two things at a time. So he's going to try to come up with, okay, where do I start? Which table do I start with? And there's lots of factors that go into that. Um, but he's going to come up with, with at least initially two sources. Um, if he's considering a nested loop, a nested loop looks like this. It has a drive, what typically called a driving table or an outer table. It's usually the smaller of the two sources. And then he has a, what's called an inner table, which is usually the larger of the two. The way that he usually processes this, the classic nested loop is he'll do a full table scan on the smaller of the two and do an index range scan on the larger. And on the larger one, that index is on that foreign key column that you're doing uh, the join on. So he'll read a record from the driving table, scan the inner table. As he finds matches, he's going to start returning those. Read another record from the driving table, scan the inner table, and just keep doing that. That's your loop that he's doing. Okay? This is better for smaller row sources. You know, not just the table size, we, we can't just consider the table size here, but what if filters were applied first? So maybe I have a table that's a million records, but the optimizer applied a filter from my where clause where this is true, and now that result set from that filter, maybe there's only a thousand records left. Okay, so we have to consider the size of the source after the filter is applied, if there is a filter. Okay, so if you do have indexes on your foreign key columns, um, the optimizer, the nested loop is something he considers 
you know, initially, because he says, oh, that's what I'm looking for. Oh, there's an index on that. That's good. That's good for a nested loop. Now, what he's also going to consider is the volume of data that's involved here. Because if the driving table happens to be quite large, that could be very inefficient. Now, we want to make sure that if he does pick two tables and they do have a difference in size or in results after filters, that he chooses the correct table also for the driving table. Because what if he puts the larger table as the driving table and the smaller one as the inner table? You know, he's got them mixed up. He's got them flipped around. Now, why in the world would he do such a thing? Um, he might do that because how does he know the volume of this data to start with? Well, he's looking at something called object statistics. They're stored in the data dictionary, the relational catalog, and those are generated by batch jobs or, or on demand, usually by your DBAs, that tell the optimizer how much data is involved here. So it's various statistics from just number of records to number of distinct uh, records based on certain columns, um, how many blocks are these records stored in, lots of different statistics there. So if they're up to date and accurate, that helps the optimizer immensely. If there's, rec if there's statistics that are missing or inaccurate, then that's how the optimizer could come up with a bad plan. So we need to make sure that that's in place first. So like I said, the nested loop, if you're looking at the explain plan, you're saying, okay, um, the two tables that he chose, and based on the filters, that makes sense that he chose the nested loop because the volume of data is such, and there's an index on the foreign key. I'm okay with that. If you see that he's trying to join a, a 10 million result set to a 10 million row result set, nested loop's probably not the, the smarter choice for him. When we talk about smaller row sources, we're talking about tens of thousands, maybe up to 100,000, uh, that type of thing. Okay. If we see that we have more data, then maybe a hash join is, is the better choice, and typically it will be the better choice. Okay, a hash join ends up being looking kind of like a nested loop join in the end run here, but it's going to be a little bit more efficient because with the nested loop, he's scanning an index. With the hash join, he's scanning a bitmap, trying to see what's matched up here. So again, he's going to try to choose the smaller row source of the two things that he's joining, and he's going to build a hash table based on the, the column or columns that you're doing your join on. You know, it's going to be a bitmap. Where, where can I find this data at? And then he's going to uh, have the second source there, which is usually the larger of the two. And then he's going to probe the hash table based on this bitmap to the second source. It's kind of, kind of in the same motion as a nested loop, but he can do it much more efficiently. This hash table is stored in memory in something called a PGA, your process global area or program global area called both things. So what kind of dictates whether he chooses a hash join or not is how efficiently or how well the DBAs have sized the PGA. Okay, so there's a PGA there. Every process that connects to the database has access to the PGA. If the PGA has been sized inefficiently, too small, and the optimizer says, okay, I want to build a hash join because the volume of data is pretty large here. And he looks at the PGA and he says, oh my gosh, there's not enough room in the PGA for this hash table. Then he's not going to choose a hash join. He might choose a nested loop join and he might consider a sort merge join, but you'll see in a minute it needs the PGA as well. So that's, that's how we end up with large nested loops that are inefficient on big volumes of data. It might merely be because our memory for storing this hash table is not big enough. Okay, So what we're looking for it typically is two things here. I know we have the sort merge join here, here to go through in just a second, but if you've got smaller row sources, look for the nested loops. If you have larger row sources that you're joining on, look for the hash join because the sort merge, as we get to it here, is typically not one that we're looking for. Okay. It's going to take both your row sources that you're trying to join together and unless they're already sorted in the, the key or the columns that you're doing the join on, he's going to have to do a sort on both row sources. So let's say we're joining two tables by order ID. 
he'd have to join have to do a sort on the first one by order ID a sort on the second one by order ID and then merge the results together and he'd have to do two sorts and if you have any volume of data that's going to be quite large he'd have to do those in the PGA as well and in this case if there's not enough room in the PGA um, he may decide either to do well I'll, I'll consider a hash join but my PGA is already too small, or he may decide to do a nested loop, whether there's an index there or not on the foreign key column, or he may just decide, hey, I have no choice. I'm going to do the sort merge even though there's no room in the PGA. And if there's not room in the PGA, then he has to do it on disk. And obviously, sorts on disk versus sorts in memory is going to be slower. So what you should be seeing is fewer sort merges because he's not going to want to do two sorts unless it's a small amount of data okay so what you should be seeing is either a lot of hash joins or a combination of hash joins and nested loops depending on your volume of your data or your result sets after filters that you're trying to join okay so you have to know your data have to know the result the uh, row sources to know is a nested loop make sense for, okay, is this small stuff or is this bigger stuff and maybe a hash join is a better choice. And then of course we want to avoid the Cartesian join, right? So this is usually a result of us writing a bad join. Okay, so maybe we, we depending on how you write your joins, We've gotten our from clause three or four tables, but in our where clause, we only have two join conditions or one join condition or two of the wrong columns or something like that. Okay, so what a Cartesian says is, I'm not really matching anything to anything. I'm going to match every row from one source to every row and the other source. That's going to do a couple things. Um, it's going to produce a lot of results, so more than what we want. Um, and it's going to take up a lot of resources. So we like to avoid that. That's usually just the result of bad queries. So, so if you look in your explain plan output, and you see it'll tell you it did a Cartesian join. Um, then you need to go back and look at your code and say, hey, did I properly join the tables or views that are involved here? All right, other things we're going to look for there. Once we've kind of decided whether or not our join method is correct or not, did he, did he use an index? You know, did he do the full table scan? Did he do, and say on the nested loop, did he do two full table scans instead of a full table scan and, and an index scan? So we're looking for the different types of index access methods that might be there as well. Okay. So we're taking a look at those. So we'll look at each one of these so you can kind of see what they look like. There was a question there about what's a good size for the PGA. You know, that's a tough one to answer because the PGA is going to be, it's area of memory that's going to be shared by all the processes on the system. So what, what the DBAs will think about is at any one point in time, for all my concurrent processes that are running, you know, how many of them are going to be doing sorts and we have to think about all the different types of operations that cause sorts. Uh, and what, what are the size of those sorts? So I need to size the PGA to handle all the concurrent sorts that might be going on. You know, think about things that um, could cause a sort. Well, obviously an order by or a group by or a distinct or creating indexes. doesn't matter if they're unique or non-unique. Um, certain types of joins, like a sort merge, uh, but needs to do that. Um, set operations, like a union or intersect or minus, those need to do sorts as well. Okay, so well, lots of things that could cause a sort. So let's look at these different index access methods. And You know, the index range scan is probably the one that we see the most, because um, we might be doing something like where, you know, you know, uh, state equals uh, Ohio, and and I might have more than one record that obviously represents Ohio there. So so he's going to scan the index. The index looks like a tree. It has by default three levels. It has a root, a branch, and a, a and a whole bunch of leaves. And the leaves are where the the values are that you're indexing. So he's going to go down to the leaf, hopefully hopefully close to where the Ohio records are, and he's going to start scanning blocks at that leaf level, looking for all the records that match Ohio in this case. And as he finds them, he's going to grab 
what's called a row ID where the ta and that will take him directly to the table data. So at the very least, when he scans an index, he can only read one block at a time. And in Oracle, the block is the lowest level that's read. So he'd have to read a block at the root, a block at the branch, at least one block at the leaf, maybe more than one, but at least one. Grab row ID, start reading a block at the table. So at the very least, he has to read four blocks. He can only read one block at a time with a range scan. And he's comparing that to, well, if I have to read four blocks to get the Ohio data using this index, he's comparing that to how many blocks do I have to read or how much I.O. do I have to do for a full table scan. And that's one of the big comparisons he has. That's why the statistics are very important at that point. And so you might see in your, in your uh, explain plan output, it might say something like you see at the bottom of the screen here on this slide. Index range scan on an index called MPIX1. He's going to scan that, go down to the leaf node, grab a row ID for the records that match, and then he's going to access the table called MP with that row ID. So when we read this, remember it's from the inside out, so this index range scan will feed the table access right above it there. Okay, so um, that's what an index range scan looks like. A unique scan is going to be faster because at most there's only going to be one match. So he, does, he knows he doesn't have to scan multiple blocks, especially at the leaf level. So when he finds his match at the leaf level, he knows he's done. He doesn't have to scan other blocks to see if there's a match or not. So it's important that indexes that should be unique, you make them unique as opposed to non-unique. So a lot of times we'll just put non-uniques on there either just in case or I'm not sure if I have it, I'm going to have any duplicates or what's going on there. If they're going to be unique, you need to make them that. Now, all primary key fields by default have a unique index. So if we're searching on primary keys like an employee ID or an order ID, those should do an index uh, unique scan on those. But, but again, just because the index is there, the optimizer doesn't have to use it. Other types of scans, um, we could have an index full scan. Um, this isn't necessarily the best one out there, but it might be better than a table full scan. Okay, the index full scan you're going to get, if, look at your query, and in your query, if you're referencing all the, col all the columns in your query happen to also be in the index. So there's no need for him to go to the table. So instead of doing an index range scan and grabbing the row IDs and passing them to the table to get those blocks, he can just do an index full scan and get all the data he needs without going to the table. Now, the problem with the full scan is that, like the range scan, he can only read one block at a time. And he's doing an index full scan, which means he's going to read every block at the leaf level. Um, this isn't necessarily a good thing. He's going to compare this to the, to, to the full table scan and see which is better. Okay, now, a little bit better than the index full scan, this sounds better already just by the name, right? An index fast full scan. How's that sound? Um, the best thing about this is that it's going to, is the second bullet there, he's going to use what's called multi-block I.O. And each of those multi-block sections that he's reading can be done in parallel as well. So full table scans are done the same way. There's a parameter in the database called DB file multi-block read count, DB file multi-block read count. And it, it will state or indicate how many blocks the database can read in a single I.O. when doing a full table scan or doing an index fast full scan. And, and by default, it's usually set to like 128. That means in one I.O., if he's doing a full table scan, he can read 128 blocks. And of course, he's comparing that to an index range scan, which he can only read one block at a time. That's why sometimes if that DB file multi-block read count parameter is, has been increased, and the optimizer says, oh, wow, I can read, you know, 512 blocks in one I.O. He'll choose a full table scan, and you're sitting there thinking, well, why can't he, why isn't he using my index? It might, the parameter setting might be influencing him to do otherwise. Okay. This is also um, good if you, uh, will be used if your query is, is accessing all the columns that happen to also be in the index as well. But also notice here that they don't come back in any particular order. 
because he's doing them in parallel. So if you need them in a particular order, you're going to have to slap an order by on it, which then might defeat the purpose and maybe not run as well anyway. Okay, so we'll look for that kind of thing. And then the last type of index access here is the uh, index skip scan. Okay, you won't see this as often. It, it sounded like a really good feature when it first came out. Where this comes into play is if you have indexes that have are made up of multiple columns or multiple fields from a table. It used to be in the older versions of Oracle, if you didn't reference the leading column in the index, you had no chance of, of Oracle using that index. The optimizer would just say, you're not referencing the leading column, I'm not even going to consider this index. They added the index skip scan feature, I think back in Oracle 9i, and it allows the optimizer to still consider using the index even though you don't reference the leading column. Now there's a lot of what ifs or it depends on this one whether he'll still use the index or not, but the key part is he won't automatically disqualify the index from consideration just because you're not referencing the leading column. Okay, you won't see that very often and there's, like I said, there's a lot of it depends on that one. Um, other things that we should look for in our explain plan output in detail here are the filters. And I, I threw a little explain plan output here on the screen for you. All right, and all the plans will be a little bit different. But notice down here in the predicate information down below, it shows you where the filters are being done. So there was a question ago about the ID column on the left. That's just an ID column, you know, numbering each operation within the plan. It's, it has no indication on the order of the steps. But if we look at the filter down below, you know, this particular query says something like this, where E dot department number equals 20. If I look down below, this, these numbers, one, two, three in this case, these all correspond to the ID column up in the uh, explain plan output up above here. So it says here the filter for E dot department number equals 20 was done at ID number three, which is this full table scan on the employee table. Okay, now I'm, I'm doing a, a join to the department table, so he also applied the filter department number equals 20 on step two. Now if you look at step two and three at, in relationship to when the join was actually done, since they're indented further, we know that they were actually done prior to the join. So he first went out got all the 20s out of the employee table, and he's estimating in the rows column here that there's five of those, and then he got the 20s out of the department table where the department number is the primary key, so there's only one of those, and then based on that information, he decided in this case to do a hash join. Now, in this case here, hash join, even though the data volume is really low, it might be acceptable for your performance, but if it weren't, probably a nested loop would be better because nested loop will perform better with smaller volumes. Even for volumes this low, it can still run better than a hash join. Now, how can I get him to do the nested loop? Well, why didn't he use the uh, index on the department number in the employee table? If I can get him to do that, then I could get him maybe to use a nested loop. Maybe there is no index on the foreign key column. So just building the index might take care of that. Okay. All right, so we want the filters to happen before the joins, because think about it this way. If I do a join between two tables and there are 10 million rows in this table and 50 million rows in this table, is it, does it sound to be more efficient to join 10 million to 50 million and then throw stuff out based on the filter? Or does it sound more efficient to filter stuff out and then do a join between 10,000 rows and 50,000 rows instead of the millions? So by looking at the explain plane, we can see when the filters happen, and that would be very important there. Okay. Right, other things to look for here are parallel operations happening. Like I said, you can hint, put hints for parallel operations, or some operations, if there are multiple CPUs on your server, which there typically is, um, if he can do them in parallel, he will. Now, how do I know that some of my query was operated in parallel? You'll see things like these operations down here below on the slide. Uh, a PX, it's a parallel transaction. That's what the PX stands for. You'll, have, you'll see a coordinator. He's kind of responsible for the overall 
um, parallel operation of that. You'll also see a PX, maybe a block iterator. He's responsible for breaking the total volume of the data into smaller sets of data so that they can be processed in parallel. And then once those are there and he's processing them, when we try to merge them back together, you'll see the, the PX send and receive. That's the communication processes between all the different splits that he had that were done in parallel. So if you put like a parallel hint on a query and you're expecting it to run faster and you're expecting it to be done in parallel, and then you run it through the explain plan and you don't see these PX operations in there, for some reason he chose not to do it in parallel and we need to figure out why. Is it because he's not recognizing how many CPUs there are? Um, does he not know how much data there is so my statistics are bad? Or what's going on there? Okay. Some of the questions are coming up there, it's talking about the design of your tables and such, and can they uh, influence the plan that could come up? Um, it's not so much the, the design of the tables as it is really the, the volume of data in the tables there. Um, the design could have some influence, but usually the design isn't going to necessarily influence the plan so much as it might influence the performance, which sounds like they should go hand in hand, but not necessarily. Um, don't know if that made any sense or not there, but so not so much influence in the plan. You know, the the volume of data and the indexes that are on the columns in those tables, however they're normalized or not normalized, influences the plan more so. All right, we're almost through here, so hang in there just a couple more minutes. How about partitioning? Uh, this is a very common thing, like I mentioned at the very start of the webinar. Tables, instead of great being in one great big heap, kind of like a big pile of dirty clothes, we can break them into partitions by some criteria. I mean, there's different types of partitions available to us. There's list partitions where we can explicitly say what, what data is going into which partition. Um, there's range partitions. There's hash partitions. And there's other types, too. And we can have subpartitions also. Like I said earlier, what this does for us is it breaks the big table into basically almost like smaller subtables. You still access the data the same way, so you would still select whatever from the table name. And the optimizer is what's called partition aware or partition smart. He knows the definition of each partition and he's comparing that to your where clause. And if your where clause indicates that, oh, I want a certain region, and he'll know that that region's in partition three, and there's no way for that region to be in partitions one, two, four, eight, whatever, he'll only scan that one partition. So it's like you're not reading from a smaller table at that point. This can be a really big deal. Now, what we're looking for when we do our queries, if we're expecting him to only read data from one partition or a smaller set of partitions, not the entire table, which means all the partitions. In our explain plan output, it'll, it'll tell us, like you see here at the bottom of the screen, it'll say partition and then the type of partition, whether it's list or range. If he's only reading one partition, it'll say single. If for some reason he f felt like, based on the criteria in your where clause, that he might find the data in more than one partition, then it would say all. And now you're doing, a, maybe your overall table has 100 million records in it, but the table you want to scan only has 100,000 in it. If it does the single, that's great. Your performance will be better. If he does the all, that's, that's just like doing a full table scan or even an index range scan on 100 million records, and your performance won't be nearly as good. So if you know you have partitions and you don't have to do anything special in your code to access just single partitions versus all the partitions, but if your performance isn't any good, if you look at the explain plan and you're not seeing partitions based on singles, then there's something going on there. Either, either our code's not quite right, so we it, it is requiring the optimizer to scan multiple partitions or our partitions maybe aren't defined correctly. So we'll need to kind of kind of look into that as well. Okay. All right. Um, there was a question there about performance and if the partitions might be too small. 
Well, the partition, you know, think of the partition just like it were another table, even though it's part of all one table there, but it's almost like there's small sets of tables. So what if a table were too small and we keep adding data? So we insert data, insert data, and then we query it and such. What happens when a table fills up and we want to insert more data? Well, the table has to extend, and yes, that can have a negative impact um, at the time of the extending, but not necessarily down the road when we run our queries. Okay, so during the insert, our, the insert performance might be worse, but well, our query uh, performance won't necessarily be worse. All right, we've got a couple more here, and then we'll wrap up. Um, statistics, um, very important. Uh, so every table, every index, things like that will have what are called object statistics, things like the number of rows in the table, um, number of blocks those rows make up, number of distinct values on the columns and in the index that we're talking about. And those are all going to influence the optimizer greatly on whether to do a nested loop, whether to do a hash join, whether to use an index, whether to do a full table scan. So what we look for in our execution plan um, is whether or not statistics are there. And so if, we, if their statistics are missing, the optimizer then has to do what's called a dynamic sampling of the object to kind of get some idea of how much data is there. So you would have to wait for the dynamic sampling to take place. And then the sample is just like any other sample. If it's a good sample that's representative of your data as a whole, then great, he might come up with a good number. If it's a sample that really doesn't represent the rest of the data of the table, that it might be skewed, then he might come up with a bad sample and then come up with a bad plan. So we want to avoid that. So. You know, bottom line is make sure statistics are available on all your tables and all your indexes. Uh, there's a data dictionary view called all underscore tables. Everybody has access to that. You do not need special privileges to access that. Um, go out there and query it once a, time, once a while to see if the number of rows in there, there's a column called num underscore rows, if it's really representative of what the real number of records are out in the table right now. The, the statistics that he looks at when running your query like today, right, right now at noon, um, they're, not up, they're not up to date up to the second. They're whenever the statistics were generated, which may have been last night or an hour ago or whenever. So if you see down here in this note section or something similar to that, that dynamic sampling was used or dynamic statistics were used, we want to avoid that. That's going to slow us down. Okay, last thing here is the cost. Okay, so we're almost there. Some people just look at the cost, and everything else we've already talked about, they ignore. They just want to see is the cost going down from one run to the next run. So in our execution plane, up in the right-hand corner, usually, there's a cost. And the overall cost for the entire query is on, on uh, the line that's represented by ID 0. Okay. When you submit your query to run and the optimizer comes up with a plan, he considers many other plans before coming up with the plan that he presents to you. And out of all the plans, the plan that he gives you is the one with the lowest cost. Cost is a very comp, you know, somewhat complicated formula internal to Oracle, internal to the optimizer, that's based on basically the resources that it's going to take to process your query. You know, how much I.O., which means reading blocks, how much CPU does he estimate, um, the type of network resources that are available to us, memory resources, whatever. He's putting those all through an algorithm and coming up with a cost. And whichever one's the lowest, that's what you get. Okay, now, what can we use the cost for? we we'll try to see, is this query going to run faster this time than it did last time? Notice the last bullet there. The, the cost is used to comp compare different plans but for the same query. So if somebody's out there doing a three table join between tables X, Y, Z and their, their cost is a 10 and I'm out there doing a join between tables A, B, C and my cost is a 2, I can't compare a 2 to a 10 there because the queries are totally different. They're going to have different processing, there's different indexes available to them and everything else. Now if I'm running a query and it's running slow and I make some adjustments by, you know, 
creating new indexes, dropping indexes, adding columns to indexes, changing parameter settings, updating my statistics, changing memory sources, something that doesn't cause me to rewrite the query, then um, I can compare the cost. It's best to kind of go through all those other things we looked at, and then you can still consider cost as, as important, but don't just consider either cost, and don't just consider all the other stuff we've already talked about. Consider them together, okay? If I make some adjustments outside of rewriting the code drastically, and I compare the cost, and now the cost goes down, in my explain plan output, I can feel a little bit better about this, one, this query will now run a little bit faster. Sometimes you'll, you'll see that just by adding an index, the, and I didn't change the query at all, the cost goes down a lot. Or just by updating my statistics, the cost will go down a lot. Okay? So that's what cost there represents. It's, like I said, it's a, based on a formula for calculating or estimating resources needed for your query. So we saw there, there's a lot of different things for us to consider when we look at the execution plan, right? Um, if we go back just to kind of summarize all those things, we're looking for full table scans, we're looking for join methods, we know which ones are better in which circumstances, nested loops versus hash joins. We look at the index scans, did he use an index, did he not use an index, why didn't he use the index, was it missing, uh, or does something cause him not to, maybe the way I wrote my code, maybe other factors um, to determine that. Um, Maybe sizes of my memory structures, like the PGA is really important, we learned here today, for influencing, am I doing hash joins or sort merge joins instead of nested loops? Do I have indexes on my foreign key columns? Um, lots of factors there, too. Was any part of this done in parallel? I'm looking for that stuff in my execution plan or not. If it wasn't, how can I get him to do that? Maybe by adding a hint, maybe not. Um, is he taking advantage of the partitions? Somebody was asking about if data spans multiple partitions, what will he do? Well, then he has no choice but to span multiple partitions. So he'll have to do uh, maybe multiple read uh, single partitions, or maybe he'd have to read all the partitions. Okay. As far as partitions go, one more thing on that. The DBAs or whoever, they can create indexes that are local to each partition, but they can also create indexes that span all the partitions. So you have what are called global partition indexes, and you also have what are called uh, local partition indexes. So those are there in just in case you have to span multiple partitions in that case there. Um, and then you have, we're looking for statistics, those are important, you can look at your execution plan, it'll tell you whether or not statistics were used for this or not. Um, if the statistics are there and they're bad, then that estimated number of rows in that execution plan might be way off. You know, if it says that, hey, I did a full table scan on this and there were 10,000 rows and you know there's really 10 million rows, then maybe the statistics were off. If, he did a, if it says he did a dynamic sampling, maybe the sample was bad. Okay. All right. So there's certainly a lot of things for us to look at in there. Um, a lot to talk about in 45 minutes or an hour. Um, if you want more information about that, you can feel free to send me an email at jmullins at themasinc.com for one thing. Um, also, everything that we talked about here today is also offered in our Oracle SQL optimization class, um, and we, that's a three-day class, so we have plenty of time in there to go into this stuff even in more detail, and also to try some of the stuff hands-on, so you can actually see what it looks like, and you can also try things to try to influence them to a different plan as well. So lots of different classes there. Now, as far as those go, you can go to our main website, themasync.com. Um, you can email John Cacaval. There's his email address there, jcac at themasync.com. There's a phone number to get in contact with him. And remember, you can always go out to themasync.com. You can get a copy of the slides today, and I encourage you to do that out at themasync.com slash webinars. Um, and then shortly after um, today's presentation is done, you can also then go out there and get a recording of uh, today. Um, where you can, can hear my voice and all that good stuff too. Okay, so I thank everybody for attending. You had lots of good questions. I know I didn't get to all the questions in the question box there, so if you want to resend me a question, uh, 
that's in there, feel free to do that. Just send it to jmullins at themasync.com, and I'll answer all the questions that I get. I enjoy doing that immensely. And for those of you that uh, have attended before or attended our classes before, it's good to see you again. And for everybody else out there and everybody that we've seen before, thank you for attending. Everybody have a good Wednesday. Um, we're not quite there so, to see the weekend yet, but almost. Okay. Thank you for attending, everybody. Make sure you go out there and get a copy of the slides and the re recording of the presentation. And hopefully today I'll help you a little bit uh, in understanding what to look for in your execution or explain plan output. Thanks. Have a good day.